Good morning, my friends, and welcome to our worship today. Know that no matter who you are and where you are on your journey of life and of faith, you are so very welcome here, and we're glad that you can join us in worship. God, we give you thanks today for our nation's veterans. We lift them up in prayer today because of their dedication and service to our country. Generation after generation, young men and women have answered our country's call. And as a result, their lives have been changed forever. We are grateful to all who have served, whether in peacetime or in periods of conflict. But today, we especially remember those who bear wounds of the body or the spirit as a result of what they have endured. They lie in our veterans' hospitals, or struggle for recovery and rehabilitation centers. They suffer from post-traumatic stress and survivor's guilt. They yearn for peace in their souls. Dear God, we ask you to heal our veterans' wounds, to banish whatever inner demons may haunt them, and to give them peace within so they may return fully to their families and to society. We thank you, God, for all our country's veterans and those past generations, and those who continue to earn this title today. May we never forget what our country has asked of them and what they have given in return. Help us to care enough to give them the respect and honor they are due. And strengthen our resolve to build a world modeled on your kingdom come where war will be pursued no more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, breathe, listen. May God speak to us today. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten young women took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those women got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other women came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Hear what the Spirit is speaking to us today. So here's a story that we all know well. And for once, it's a story that makes perfect sense. Wise and foolish bridesmaids. The wise prepared for all eventualities. The foolish not thinking ahead. And as a result of their foolish failure to prepare, they end up excluded, left out of the wedding banquet. We even get told the punchline, the moral of the story, in the final words of our reading. Keep awake, for you don't know the, hour, the day or the hour. And that's sound advice, especially in a context where the early church expected Jesus to return at any moment. Stay focused. Stay active. Don't slack off. Stay awake. And it all makes such perfect sense, except where it doesn't. Look again at that final admonition, stay awake. Falling asleep wasn't the mistake. Or rather, if it was, it was a mistake made by all ten of the bridesmaids. They all became drowsy, they all fell asleep. If stay awake was the point, then all ten of them failed the test. 
So we are told that the point of the story is that we should keep awake. And it's worth noting that the translators differ on whether the words at the end of the reading, keep awake therefore, are Matthew quoting Jesus or Matthew adding his own punchline to Jesus' story. The Greek actually doesn't distinguish, doesn't tell us where the quotation finishes. But the story itself doesn't seem to support the moral. Was the failing of the foolish bridesmaids falling asleep, or was it a lack of preparation? And once you start to pull the threads, the parable starts to come apart in other ways as well. And I have to admit, there are some major problems with Matthew's parable. First, unlike some of his others, where he at least bases the story on one, of Jesus, on one that Jesus might have told, I have some questions about whether Jesus ever told this story. It was not his style, or even if he did, he would never have given the moral of the story. Matthew, you see, is obsessed with the end times and all the wonderful divine wrath and judgment that comes with it. He portrays Jesus as an apocalyptic prophet carrying a sandwich board on street corners, telling people to repent. But Jesus was into the fierce urgency of now, not later. The kingdom of heaven is at hand was more his style. Carpe diem, seize the day, was his battle cry. Grab it, it is here for the taking. Matthew and some in the early church, however, seemed to think he was speaking of a worldly kingdom. And since the Romans were still occupying their land a generation after Jesus' death, they had to choose between Jesus being wrong or put a spin on his words. Matthew chooses to spin the story, attributing the parable of the ten bridesmaids to him. In truth, it was either Matthew's own literary invention or he appropriated it from the common folklore of the region. Its purpose was to reassure his readers anxious for freedom from oppression. God's kingdom was coming. Now there are other reasons why I think Jesus didn't tell this parable. His were so much better. He used humor, exaggeration, and paradox. I mean, just think, camels going through the eye of a needle. Matthew's, on the other hand, is mundane, unimaginative, and moralistic. His message of being prepared is, is a virtue, is hardly groundbreaking and headline-grabbing. But the most important reason, I think, that Jesus had nothing to do with this parable is that it is a story that applauds building barriers. Matthew's story creates insiders and outsiders. The closed door to the unwise bridesmaid, bridesmaids is a definite boundary. Jesus' whole ministry was about breaking down social and religious boundaries, not creating them. He was about good Samaritans and welcoming back errant children with fatted calves. He wasn't divide, into dividing people into pens of sheep or goats, which is one of Matthew's favorite pastimes. This parable is an illustration of Matthew's gospel, not Jesus' vision of God's realm. But let's look at this parable again and see if we can salvage something out of it. The story is that 10 young girls are waiting to play their role at the wedding of a friend. All of them fall apart because the bridegroom is late. So when they wake up, half of them, unprepared, suddenly realize that they need more oil for their lamps. But that's okay, because the other half have come prepared with flasks of oil for their lamps. Surely, they can spare a little for their forgetful friends. But no, their attitude is harsh. It's your own stupid fault you forgot the oil. Go and get yourself some more. We can't possibly help you out. We aren't willing to take the risk that our oil might run out. And I wonder, is this really the attitude, the behavior that is being praised here? This mean smugness on the part of the well-prepared at the expense of those now in need. Is this really the image of the kingdom of God? That those who have made the right decisions have been prepared, even they, though they too fell asleep, will refuse to lend a hand to help the foolish. There is a worldly wisdom displayed here. A practical wisdom making sure that you are okay, that you are able to play your part in the celebrations. But is it the wisdom of the kingdom of God? 
There is something disturbing here. Praise being given to those who act wisely but self selflessly. Those who send away a friend in need rather than sharing what they have through their foresight available. And the thing is, when something doesn't seem to quite fit, when something about a parable just jars with you or disturbs you, I'm fairly sure that's when the parable starts to do its work. When it pushes you to ask more questions, to set aside the obvious and wonder about other readings. And so that got me thinking. If we had to learn something from this story, what mistake did the foolish bridesmaids actually make? Of course, they were unprepared, the obvious point of the parable, and they compounded their error by falling asleep. Matthew's punchline. For had they stayed awake, they may have realized their problem sooner and fixed it in time. But what about when they awoke and realized that they were in trouble and that the others would not help them? And this is where I wonder if the biggest mistake they made was at that point to leave to try to buy more oil. On one level, of course, it was the sensible thing to do. They had made a mistake in their lack of foresight and compounded it by falling asleep. Their friends refused to help them out, so they set out to solve the problem. They go to get more oil to fix the mess they've made to make things right. And in doing so, they missed out on the wedding banquet. Suppose instead that they had stayed with their lamps dark to greet the bridegroom. Would he have told them they were no longer welcome simply because they had made a mistake? If this is a parable of the kingdom of God, surely not. Or would the bridegroom have laughed at them at their foolishness and told them to set the lamps aside and come in to join him at the feast? Knowing what I know of God, I think that is more likely. So perhaps the foolishness of those five was not so much in their lack of preparation, for which of us has never been unprepared, nor their falling asleep. I mean, who amongst us is always alert, always ready, always living such that if Jesus came back, we would be 100% happy about how we spent our last day, our last week. Perhaps their final foolishness, the thing that really caused their grief, was a lack of trust in the generosity of the bridegroom. For they had this sense that if they were to go to the banquet, they needed to get every single thing right. They had made a mistake, so they had to fix it. They couldn't possibly show up unprepared with the evidence of their foolishness obvious for all to see. To meet the bridegroom, they felt, they had to have it all together, all sorted, all under control. Anything they had done wrong, they needed to make right before he came for them. It's an aptitude I'm sure we all recognize in ourselves. I do in mine, my life. Where I have failed, I must fix. Where I have been foolish, I must compensate. And it stems, stems from a true and good root. The desire to take responsibility for our failures and to take concrete steps to put them right. But it becomes the greatest of all foolishness when we conclude that until we have fixed things, we are not welcome at God's table, in God's kingdom, at God's banquet. It becomes the greatest of all foolishness when we deny God's extravagant grace and absolutely unconditional love and forgiveness for all. And it becomes the greatest of all foolishness when we think that we have to put on our Sunday best and can only be a part of Christ's church if we have our lives and our faith all figured out and perfect and can fit into the mold of what it means to be a good Christian. In the United Church of Christ, we say, no matter who you are and where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And we mean it. This parable today is a story about God's extravagant grace. It is a story that reminds us that our greatest sin is to underestimate God's grace. 
and God's love and God's compassion. It is a reminder that in God's kingdom and in Christ's body, you are welcome just as you are. And there is no need to have everything sorted, everything fixed, everything perfect. If your lamp is out of oil, don't rush off. Stay, lamp or no lamp. For here, by the grace of God, all, and I mean all, are welcome. Amen. Grace that flows like a river washing over me Fount of heaven, love of Christ overflowing me Thank you, Jesus You said And so let us pray in this moment when we bring our prayers to God. Loving God, bring stillness to our hearts, empty our minds of other things and direct our thoughts to those who especially need our prayers. When we reflect on how you have supported and cared for us in the past, we cannot fail to give you thanks. When we consider the way you give us courage and help for each new day, we are filled with a sense of gratitude and praise. When you lift us from the pit of doubt and despair, our whole being feels renewed and refreshed. What a comfort it is to know the love and support you bring to us through your Son and by your Spirit. In our joy, let us not forget those this morning who know little else but sadness. 
in our sense of gratitude and praise, let us not forget those whose lives are filled with regrets and heartbreaks. In our feeling of support and guidance, let us not forget those who feel they have struggled against life's difficulties and disappointments, alone and uncared for. And in our desire to give you praise, do not blur our vision of the hardship in this life, the despair of the homeless in our city, the feelings of guilt by parents who cannot feed their children, the worries and fears of those in hospital, the isolation of the lonely, the deep sense of loss to those in bereavement. Gracious God, you are not only the God of this world, you are the ruler of your heavenly kingdom. Strengthen us while we live out our life on this earth to show the compassion and the caring of Jesus. Hold before us the reality of, the, of your kingdom where there is no suffering, pain, or regret, so that we may share it with those who are without hope. For we ask all these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we have been given so much by our loving God. The time of the offering is an opportunity for us to give a portion of what we have received back so that God's love can be felt by others. Your generosity to this church assists friends and strangers those who believe as we do, and those who believe differently, neighbors across town and partners across the globe. Your gifts are a blessing. So church, let us give generously. There are three ways you can give. You can go online to centralunionchurch.org and click the Give button to give electronically. You may also scan the QR code on your screen and that will guide you through the same online giving process. If you prefer, you may also write a check to the church and mail it to the address on your screen. May our gifts be transformed in ways that reflect God's love throughout our community and the world. And now, my friends, as you go out into the world, Go knowing that you are loved unconditionally by a God of grace. Go to share that love with all you encounter in the communities of your daily lives. Go in peace to love and to serve our living and loving God. Amen. Christ be And so now it's time for a few announcements about our common life as church. The first is that you are invited to meet and greet the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson. As you may know, the Reverend Karen Georgia Thompson is the new General Minister and President of the United Church of Christ. And she will be paying a visit to Honolulu and to Central Union Church next Thursday, the 16th of November and you will have an opportunity to meet her at a gathering at, in the women's building at 10.30 a.m. So I hope you will take that opportunity to come and talk to Dr. Tom, Reverend Dr. Thompson and to hear about her vision for the United Church of Christ. Also, a reminder that on the 26th of November at 10 a.m. again, there will be the Advent Workshop. Uh, join CUC's Children's Ministry as we prepare for Advent with our annual Advent workshop. And finally, even though our stewardship campaign is complete, 
If you haven't yet submitted your estimate of giving card, you can do so. You can still mail it into the office or drop it in the offering plate, or you can go online to www.centralunionchurch.org and make your offering online, make your estimate of giving online. Um, and I encourage you to do that so that we can plan for the year ahead in terms of our mission and our ministry. Thank you for your generosity and for sharing of your time, talent, and treasure.